you're really the only person who can stop you from doing whatever you want to do where you think you need to go in the martial arts. Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 10 of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. My name is Jeremy Lesniak, your host for the show, and the founder of Whistlekick, where we make the world's best sparring gear and some really great apparel, too. If you're new to our show, you can learn more about Whistlekick at whistlekick.com, and you can learn more about the podcast at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. On today's show, we have Master Brendan Goodall, a Taekwondo practitioner from Vermont. Unlike many guests on the show, I've known Master Goodall a long time, and I know him quite well. We sat down recently to test out the portable recording studio we've built, and we ended up with a great interview. No matter how long you've known someone, they always have more to say, which is probably why I had so much fun talking to Master Goodall, or, as he's asked me to call him during our conversation, Brendan. So here it is. Brendan, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Hey, how's it going, Jeremy? (laughs) It's good. How are you? I'm doing well. Listeners might hear a different audio quality to this, because this is the first interview that I've done in person, so... Thank you, Brendan, for breaking me in, breaking the new equipment in. I appreciate it. Well, you know, it's one of my favorite things to do, be a guinea pig, try new things out. There's <laughs> a lot of ways we could go with that. We're not going to go with any of them. That's why I didn't go with the way appreciate that, that. you expect me to. That. So why don't you tell us a little bit about your history with the martial arts, when you started and all that? All right. So I started in the large, booming city of Randolph, Vermont, population 2,000 people way back in August of 1997. And I started, my main style is Taekwondo. My only style is Taekwondo, actually. (laughs) Is Taekwondo. And I started with one of my favorite people in the world, Master Randy Rota, like I said, when I was seven. And behind all of that, I had an overwhelming urge to be either a Ninja Turtle or a Power Ranger. They've both kind of stuck with me throughout my 19 years in the martial arts, but... I don't have a lot of hope of getting blasted with radioactive ooze, and I'm not really a teenager with attitude anymore. So now I'm just training because I found something that I really, really enjoy doing. Okay. And you lack a carapace. Yes. That's a shell for those of you that, that aren't nerds like Brendan and I. <clears throat> not nerds, connoisseurs. Sure enough. Okay. And what variant of Taekwondo do you train in? I train in... Well, I've done both, actually. When I first started, we did Olympic-style Taekwondo. That's WTF for you people who are out there. And then gradually, right around when I got my red belt, we switched back over to ITF Taekwondo, which is what I continue training in now. Okay. And that's an important distinction for people that don't train in Taekwondo because of the, the sparring is different and the forms are different. Mm-hmm. So, Yeah, um, WTF Taekwondo is much, much more publicized because it's an Olympic event and... Mm-hmm. Let's face it, a lot of the knockout videos on YouTube you see are usually WTF Taekwondo because they tend to be a lot more fun to watch. <laughs> cool. Um, why did you get started? Um, like I said earlier, the big reason is I wanted to be a Power Ranger. But what happened was my mom was looking for something for me to do. Like I played all the sports. I did baseball. I did soccer. I did basketball. I stopped doing basketball very quickly because I was very, very bad at it. Mm-hmm. But I started Taekwondo in a summer program. I think I did that for two years, and then apparently I showed enough moxie behind it that my parents let me actually start taking Taekwondo, which was probably the best decision that we've all made. Cool. Okay. And why have you stuck with it? I found... I've always thought about this a lot. I found Taekwondo is a great way to identify myself as a person. It's done a lot of things for me. You know, it's given me the ability to express myself when I might not know what to say. Mm -hmm. And it's given me the ability to talk to people, which is something I'm not great at. I like talking, don't get me wrong, but (laughs) sometimes knowing what to talk about is the hard thing. I can attest to that. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think the big reason is it's fun and this one's more for martial artists who've trained 10 plus years. Old master story time is the best thing ever. Just hearing about the old days. I think if anything else happened in my life, I would give up my right hand just so I could continue listening to people tell stories about the old days and how much fun they had and all the connections and relationships that they built through martial arts. Right. And you're left-handed. 
That too. So it's important that people know that. I'm very left-handed, so losing my right hand actually wouldn't be that big of a loss. <laughs> okay. And of course, that's kind of the impetus for martial arts radio is, is getting people to tell their martial arts stories because, mm-hmm. I mean, it's really just selfish. I just want to hear everybody's great stories because I haven't heard them all. So yeah. I get to hang out and listen to them first. Yeah. So how about you tell us your best martial arts story? Um, I don't know if this is necessarily my best because... But it's definitely one of my favorites to think about. I was sparring for Grand Championship at a tournament a couple years ago, and we were tied like 4-4, 5-5. And I just thought, I've been kind of playing it patient this entire fight. I'll blitz him as soon as the judge says go. So I do that. I blitz him. I have this startling slowdown of life as I'm blitzing him. What if I'm too far away? What if he moves? What if he hits me first? What if I miss? I tend to miss every once in a while when I go for a blitz from super far away. But it didn't, and I won. But in that 10-second exchange, I felt like it took two minutes just because of all the things I was thinking about. And it really clarified for me, like, you know, martial arts is fun because it's a game of reaction. Hmm. Do you have any other stories that you might want to share? Sure. I'm going to kind of jump around in the questions and I'll delve more into those. But one of my best friends is named Fred Forsberg. He's also a martial artist and we've known each other for about 10 years since I started competing as an adult in Taekwondo tournaments. He's actually scheduled to be on the show at some point in the near future. Shameless plug, folks. (laughs) I don't know what episode that'll be yet. So I get foreshadowing plug. Look forward to it. It'll be amazing. But... Fred and I have talked about this a lot. Like, for as close as we are now, Fred was always the guy coming up on the tournament circuit. He was that person everyone wanted to beat because no one could seem to touch him. And he told me straight up, like, for the first four years I knew you, you were cannon fodder. You were just that fight I needed to fight to get on to the next one. (laughs) But then, you know, we got to know each other more. You started coming up to my class every once in a while, and... We actually became friends. You were still cannon fodder, but I liked you more. And that's always one of my favorite things because that's how relationships develop through martial arts. Through hitting each other, talking with each other, trying to beat the bejesus out of each other. And I think they make better friends because of that. I think you get to know someone pretty well when you compete against them routinely and and you get to see them at their best and, and it less than their best and watch them progress. It gives you a perspective on who they are that uh, makes a good foundation for friendship. Very much so. Oh, I just thought of another one. Sure. Um, So I'm a very visual learner, and one of the things that really helps with is learning forms. So I might have learned a couple out-of-rank forms a couple years before I was supposed to. Mm -hmm. So I learned one of our fourth on set of patterns, so that'd be our master patterns, called Moon Moo. It's the pinnacle of all taekwondo forms it's the most technically difficult if you can't do it um, it just doesn't look right and you can't hide behind other things that you're good at in that pattern Mm -hmm. but so yeah i learned that as a second dawn and one day my instructor had a moment of i forgot what rank you are so he told me to go work with moon moo on with one of our fourth dons and i told him sir i i can't do that he outranks me and he's like, oh, good point. Go work on whatever you want to. Well, the fourth Don I was supposed to work with on this um, called me over to help him anyways because he's a mean person and he wanted to get me in trouble, I have to think. So I did. I was working with him on it. And I'd like to think I was doing a fairly good job. But one of the other masters walked in looked at me and was like, what are you doing? He told me to, sir. I had to. So that earned me the nickname from for a couple of years that stuck quite well called the foreign exchange student because <laughs> I didn't quite understand how things were supposed to go, but I tried hard. Fair enough. I haven't heard that story. I like that one. So let's move on a little bit. Obviously, you've spent a lot of time in the martial arts and it's certainly shaped who you are. How would you say it's made you a better person? In terms of growth in myself and martial arts taekwondo taught me that i like to learn i mean that's something that a lot of kids go through like oh this is boring i don't want to do it 
Um, Taekwondo was fun enough for me that it kind of helped reinforce the fact that maybe school can be fun. Maybe there are interesting things that they're trying to teach us, and it doesn't just have to be, oh, I got to wake up so early and just go deal with this for six hours. Hmm. So it really helped me buckle down and focus because it made me start looking for things that interested me. And that's kind of how I've carried myself through, and it's helped me grow as a person because what's life if you're not trying to learn something? I would agree with that. Cool. And what other than Taekwondo do you like learning about? Well, I'm going to shameless plug. I'm an engineer. I do, I design mostly roads. So I really like learning about things like math and weird as this sounds. I like learning about dirt and concrete too. (laughs) They're kind of job specific, but they're still interesting. Has your knowledge of concrete helped you learn how to break concrete? It's taught me that if I do try to break concrete, I'm going to make my own. Oh, because I can make really bad concrete. So that you could you could have a leg up on everybody if you go to competition, bring your own concrete blocks. Exactly. I can make it right in the parking lot. There you go. And you could perhaps make concrete for other people that wanted to cheat in competition. Not cheat. Give themselves a strategic advantage. <laughs> Let's call a spade a spade here. True that. All right, so let's shift gears a little bit now. Think about a low point in your life that the martial arts has helped you move through and and carry on, and tell us about that. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm going to just kind of lump in the deaths of people close to me. Mm -hmm. Because like a lot of people, I deal with grief, grief through physical expression. So hitting stuff mostly. Mm. And Taekwondo's always been that safe place where I can do it. Because A, a lot of the people there are going to understand if I accidentally thump them a little bit harder than they think I should. Or you'll have a very good instructor like Master Oda was who would make classes so incredibly hard that you had to focus on what you were doing. And it kind of helped air out all the bad feelings that you could have. Mm. And that's always been the way I've dealt with it. Like my grandma passed away recently and luckily I was down in Randolph. I stopped in and I saw Master Oda and I felt so much better after an hour and a half of just Taekwondo and teaching and helping people get better and Mm. hitting them a little bit. I'm sorry about that. Of course being a recent loss, but, um, sounds like you, you dealt with it well and you've dealt with these other well and, it's a kind of an interesting recurring theme that's starting to come up. And, of mm. course, you know, as we're recording this, only four episodes have been released. So there are, um, there are several episodes that have been recorded and edited and just haven't gone live yet, so you wouldn't have heard them. But um, it's kind of a recurring theme that's it's carrying through is that martial arts is helping people deal with grief. That, that that's kind of been the low point that a lot of people are, are selecting to talk about, you know, loss of significant relationship or death. And that their their time in martial arts, their ability to maybe turn it up a notch or to engage in more intense physical training has been their stability hmm. through that loss. Yeah. So it's not surprising that you're identifying that same thing. Cool. Um, do you want a low point in martial arts? If you'd like to share one. Sure. Um, in 2011, I moved up to Burlington and for a month I tried to drive back down to Randolph every night we had class and then you know just try and maintain that relationship but with your instructor with my instructor and with everybody in Randolph Mm -hmm. but the big problem with that for me was for a very long time in that school I wasn't really working with people the same caliber there wasn't anyone around to push me so you, I was... You were the high rank in that school. Exactly. I, I can speak from experience. And I had great people like Jeremy there, but with such a busy life that he had, he couldn't be there as much as I necessarily needed him to be. Hmm. So I kind of felt like I was being stagnant in my martial arts training because I wasn't always the most self-motivated person. I didn't know how to push myself to the next level. Mm-hmm. 
And I've always believed that you need people to push you to that level. So I was really maintaining that connection out of respect for Master Oda, who has done more for me than almost anybody outside of people I'm related to by blood. Sure. And so, you know, you get stagnant, you get bored, you start thinking like, what am I going to do? So luckily through martial arts, I've developed a gigantic extended family and I found that moment of, I'll just go train with Master Rhoda's stepson, Master Leonard Jordan. And I was kind of nervous because, A, I didn't want to have that talk that's like telling your parents you're ready to move out. Mm. Or You mean by changing, by who, changing. You're, who you're calling your exactly. primary instructor? Or breaking up with someone or telling your boss of a job that you love that you need to leave. Mm. And I flip-flop back and forth like maybe i can do it maybe i'll stop and kind of take care of myself for a little bit and i finally sat down had that talk with master Oda, and i'd been in contact with master yordan quite a bit because as my instructor steps on i was fairly close with that school to start with mm-hmm. and he was also the only school i thought about going to it's like well i'm in burlington that means master yordan i know there are lots of great schools but I know him. I'm comfortable with him. And he was he ran classes close to where you were? Yes, very much so. Okay. And it's really scary to have that conversation. And when I did it, you'd just feel better. Name someone other than the people you've referred to as your instructors mm-hmm. that have had... Um, let's say, an important role in your martial arts upbringing. All right. Um, I'll start with you know, one of the usual ones. I'm going to go with my dad because he was the money behind me training, going to tournaments, doing everything for a very long time. And he made it clear to me from the start, if I don't see you putting the work in, I'm not going to pay for you to do this. Mm-hmm. So it always kind of gave me that extra incentive of – yeah, I should probably still like this. Otherwise, I'm not going to be able to do it. <laughs> and he, that simple statement right there always motivated me to work hard, always kept me in the moment with what I was doing. Cool. He was also very close friends with Master Rota through interactions when he worked at the bank. So, you know, there were those nights Dad would come to pick me up from class, and he'd look over and he'd go, you know, Randy, that's Master Rota's first name for people like me who aren't supposed to know that he doesn't look tired oh you know you're right go kick the heavy bag how long sir Eh, until you look tired okay sir so i'd like he usually gave me a number of like 400 kicks or whatever and like i'd blast through the first 75 i'd get distracted by like a breeze or something they said because i wasn't the most focused of child all the time but i got by and I'd lose count. I was like, do you know where I was at, sir? Yeah, one. Yes, sir. <laughs> Thank you. So that was always a fun little interaction that we had mm-hmm. within there. Um, I don't know. Can I do a shameless plug of how great a friend we were way back in the day? Mm. I'm going to make you pick one more if you're going to talk about me. Fine. <laughs> <laughs> I've got plenty. That's fine. All right. Um, yeah, I'm going to go with you, Jeremy. I mean, we met when I was 16 and I was kind of hitting one of those. There's not really any good people here for me to work with. I'm the senior rank. There's no one else my age. I'm not saying we're the same age, but you're closer than most everybody else. Mm -hmm. And we've been an amazing team ever since then, I'd have to say. It's true. And just the fact that you can walk in, we both have things that we're good at that we both need to work on Mm -hmm. like i was very good at helping teach you the forms Mm -hmm. and reteaching the forms (laughs) and reteaching the forms (laughs) and maybe some of the more taekwondo aspects of what we're doing because let's face it a punch is a punch and a kick's a kick and for the most part you're decent at both of those i like to think so yeah and you were always very good at helping keep me focused making me actually want to get better physically and working with me on presence because I'm kind of unassuming. 
always like being the guy who likes making jokes. I'm not really good at the whole, I have a serious tournament, de- tournament demeanor and rrr, 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 that kind of stuff. And you kind of helped me find something that works. I'm not the guy who's out there screaming, yelling, and looking like I want to rip somebody's head off. But you helped give me that sense of I know what I'm doing and I'm good at it. And mm-hmm. I've always appreciated that. Thank you. Mm-hmm. All right. You said I had to do one more. You have to do one more. <laughs> <laughs> this one's kind of out of left turn, and I can say what I want about him because I know he's not going to listen to this. When I started Taekwondo, there was this kid named Colby. He was a couple years younger than me, but he'd been training since he was like four. So when I was a seven-year-old white belt, he was probably a seven-year-old high blue belt. Mm-hmm. And I remember the first major testing I went to, he was testing for his black stripe, which is right before black belt. And Colby's natural ability was something that always astounded me. Because I knew it was something that I didn't quite have, but just the ease which he did things that some of the adults wouldn't even try, like breaking boards. He was always a little kid out there like, I'm going to run up, I'm going to do like a 10-board sidekick, it'll be fine. I'm exaggerating, obviously, but he was that kind of kid. And his work ethic was always impressive, too, because you know he was on the tag end of us doing like national competitions and things like that, so he had that incentive to work harder than everybody else, which in turn helped pull us forward and Mm -hmm. make us all better at the same time. He also had a mom and a grandma who were merciless with what he was doing and is someone, like I said, who didn't always focus very well. That Their um, correcting of him in the middle of class when he was working on things helped me a lot too because I had a feeling that you know, if he's doing that wrong, I'm probably doing that wrong. Mm. I should fix it too. And I have to say that probably got me through a lot of things that I might have been doing wrong, like bending my knees wrong in a stance, punching lazily, not throwing a good kick. So it was always cool having someone younger than I was out there who could be such a icon and a pillar of martial arts excellence. Cool. All right, well, those are... Two really good ones and, and, and me, so well, reserve you know, judgment about me. That's judge him poorly. Everyone else can judge me. That's fine. <laughs> All right. So you've mentioned a few times about your that you've spent time in competition. Mm-hmm. Have you always done competitions? Is that something that, that goes back pretty early in your martial arts career? I started competing when I was a yellow belt. So yeah, pretty much pretty since on. the beginning of my martial arts career. And is it something you've done consistently throughout, or have you taken breaks? Um, I've never really taken a break. I might have missed a couple tournaments here or there because of other things that came up that were probably slightly more important, but I've been pretty consistent. Okay. And I assume then that you enjoy it. It's getting slightly less fun than it used to be, but yeah, okay. I enjoy it a lot. What, still. what did you love about it then? You know, if we go back, what was... What what are the highlights of competition for you? Um, the camaraderie, I mean, the people that you compete with. I mean, for me, I competed pretty consistently with like the same small group of people up through black belt. So we got to be pretty close through going out there, trying to beat each other at forms, breaking, sparring. Mm-hmm. And that was a really fun group of friends, and it opened up a wider group of friends and family for me that was kind of nice to have. Cool. Cool. And you said martial arts, you said martial arts competition is kind of waning for you now. Why is that? I think just because I've been doing it for 19 years. I mean, I've gone out, I've won my grand championship trophies. I've had my bad days. I've had my amazing days. There's, Unless I find that, I guess I either need to find something that re-motivates me to compete, like going to different tournaments, meeting Mm -hmm. new people, but I've done a lot of it, and I'm kind of at the point where I don't need to compete, and if I want to compete, I will, but Mm -hmm. I don't feel obligated to do it anymore. Okay. It's like helping out. What did you, if you could pick one thing that you learned about yourself from competition what might that be i can't take things personally 
Okay. Tell me more. Um, I'm going to say my favorite thing to do in competition right now is forums Mm -hmm. because it's the one thing out there that you can't say you did worse because of everybody else in there. Can't say the judges were biased towards that person sparring. The holders sucked at holding the boards. My side broke in the middle of my pattern and I couldn't finish because it stabbed somebody in the face. (laughs) It's the one thing where I'm the only person who can say whether I'm going to do a good job with this or not. And if I don't get the scores I did, as long as I felt like I did a good job, it wasn't such a big deal. Mm Mm-hmm. I'd still get a little grouchy if I don't think I do did as well as I should have, but it doesn't last and I don't hold it against anybody else who might have scored me lower than I think that I need to. It's a good lesson to learn. It's a hard lesson to learn. It is very hard. I wasn't lesson good at it for a very long time. If you could train with anybody, any martial artist, living, dead, uh, that you haven't trained with already, you've trained with quite a few people and some very amazing people. Who would you want to train with and why? Um, I've got a couple. This one completely involves people that I've already trained with. My current instructor, Master Jordan, trained, did like the bulk of his super amazing martial arts training at Johnson College in the early 80s. So as I like to remind him a lot, <clears throat> when I was born, if I could, I would go back then and I would meet all these people that I hold in such high esteem way back then and see what they were like before they age caught up with them and doing so many superhuman feats when they were so young Mm. and just see what the differences were back then. Okay. If it was a person that I'd never met before, which is probably more what you're going for. Both are valid. I think Mm -hmm. it's kind of a neat idea. You've answered it differently than other people have, but yeah. Uh, Yeah, I always try to be different. Um, I would go train with June Rayer Heel Cho. And both of them, strictly because of what they've done for the martial arts, like I'm sure most people have heard of them. You've seen them do the bit parts of the angry old Korean master in movies. Mm-hmm. And they just always seemed like amazing people. And what they did to get to where they were, like they came over on the international team or the demo team way back in the day. And they were just like, I'm going to stay here. They broke off from General Cho and lived their life and made their living from the bottom up, teaching people martial arts. I would love to spend time with them and see exactly what it was like for them to go through. Plus, mm. Junri is the most in shape 80 something year old man I've ever met. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. And I like being put to shame like that sometimes. It would be interesting to, to it will be interesting to see because, you know, he won't die. Chuck Norris in his 80s, you know, we got about 10 years for him to catch up with June Rhee, but, you know, maybe, maybe there should be some uh, debate, not so much about Chuck Norris and Bruce Lee, but Chuck Norris and June Rhee, because they're both alive and older, but amazing. Yeah, I remember I was skimming through YouTube videos one day for martial arts things. It's like, June Rhee does 100 push-ups for his 80th birthday. It's like, Really? And he did them in like a minute. And how were they? They were better push-ups than I've seen a lot of people do. Mm. Did them on his knuckles. There was a point he was counting. He got bored. He started talking with some people. Are we still doing push-ups? <laughs> I think he kind of just took his hands off the ground, put them behind his head. <laughs> and just had a really good time. And it, that's the kind of dedication that you really want to have. And I think meeting him would be one of the coolest things ever. That would be cool. Yeah, he's a pretty amazing guy. You mentioned, you know, those two gentlemen appearing in in movies. Do you have a favorite martial arts film? I know you watch quite a few. No, I've never seen a martial arts film in my <laughs> life. It's only three quarters of my movie collection. Um, I think overall, my I mean, like a lot of people who I've heard say. And this for the Taekwondo department. I love Best of the Best. It's one of my favorite movies. Mm -hmm. But I think overall, my favorite martial arts movie is Drunken Master. Mm. Just seeing Jackie Chan out there and having a fun time with martial arts, which wasn't something that people always saw way back in the day. 
It was always, you got to be tough. You got to be strong. You got to be fast. Not go out there and act like a drunk lady. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's amazing that movie is still held up pretty well. It's such an amazing movie. Do you have a favorite martial arts actor? Michael Jai White. Okay. Why? He's, for me, always been that good blending of the old school, rigid, fast, linear martial arts people and like the new school. Look at me jump up. I'll spin around for a minute and a half, <laughs> kick you, then land. <laughs> and incredible. just in terms of what he can do being a 6'2 professional fitness model type physique yeah. is one of those amazing things out there. And hearing his love for the martial arts, how much he's done for it, how much he says it's done for him. He's another person I'd really like to meet. Yeah. If only to see how many times he could bench press me a lot. Probably. Yeah. He's, he's a cool guy. He, um, the more I've come to learn about who he is as a, as a person, the more I've come to respect him. I mean, Obviously, it's hard not to respect his martial arts skill, but, you know, when you can respect a person for who they are, you know, that's a whole other dynamic. And he can do non-martial arts movies, too. Yeah. But if you want to see a hilarious martial arts movie with him, watch Black Dynamite. Okay. It's like uh, old black exploitation, black exploitation films. You know, oh, crap. who is the guy in Enter the Dragon with the afro? Yeah. Yeah, like he did that kind of movie and it was the funniest thing I've ever seen. Like the opening scene in the movie is an ad for malt liquor. <laughs> okay. Well, well, I'll link that in on the show notes page. I appreciate and, that. And I think I'm going to have to watch that myself. I'll let you borrow it. Oh, you have it. Okay. I, do have it. I shouldn't be surprised. <laughs> um, in addition to your quality Academy Award level. <laughs> Film collection. I know you're an avid reader. Um, any martial arts books that you would recommend to people? Um, yeah, I can always pull off a couple. Okay. Um, the first one I would recommend is kind of more just for Taekwondo people. I guess the second one is too, but the first one's the actual encyclopedia of Taekwondo that General Cho wrote when he was developing the art. Not so much for like the techniques and but the why he made things the way he is his theories on what a martial artist should be like what they should do yeah. how they should carry themselves it's kind of interesting especially when you think of the inconsistencies between you should love everybody respect everybody la da 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 da, da. and yeah we're better than karate <laughs> not saying we are but that, that was, was pretty obviously throughout his writings and it was right. good stuff um the other one is called the killing art mm -hmm. just because it delves into that part of taekwondo that it's the book you it is the book i bought for <laughs> christmas um it delves into that part that no one really wants to talk about like the seedy dark underworld of taekwondo mm -hmm. and the fact that general cho was a very very driven person and he didn't have time for anyone else and just the interaction between the Korean government and him as he was trying to create Taekwondo and like they'd send these masters over there and they'd have them kidnap Korean defectors, expatriates. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure what the technical term is, but like kidnap them, bring them back to Korea so they can be reinstituted into the motherland. And just all the, it's like reading a Robert Ludlum book, all this spy stuff. And it's like, how did that happen? You've got to be kidding me. He killed that many people during the Vietnam War. Oh mm. my God. It's interesting because this book's come up a couple of times with other interviews and it seems like it's something that people that are passionate about Taekwondo should really consider making part of their, uh, almost curriculum, something that, that maybe it shouldn't be required reading. Maybe that's a little bit too strong, but yeah. anybody that's really serious about Taekwondo and its history should consider reading because it adds a whole different dynamic. Yeah. Um, I would agree with that because 
it's one of those books that for me kind of opened my mind to what might have actually happened as opposed to well he told me it was like this he told me it was like that taekwondo is all nice and kind of friendly now I mean, there's still those obvious tensions, but it's not as bad as it used to be. Hmm. And it's interesting to see, like, well, if this had happened this way, where would we be right now? Right. Would we even be here training? That kind of thing. And like he said, I love reading, and it's a bad day if I don't read. I recommend everybody keep reading. Paper, not Kindle. <laughs> Fair enough. Um. Do you have any martial arts related goals for the future? Yeah, I guess so. I mean, it's a really strong goal. It sounds like something you've thought about often. I I do think about it often. It's just how far do I want to take it? Okay. Um, my, I'm going to say whatever. I want to get my fifth degree. I know I'm not up for that for a very long time, Mm -hmm. but it's still something I want to do because it opens more doors and what they're willing to teach me. Okay. And like I said, I want to be the eternal student and always learning things. So um, I want to get better at teaching okay? because I'm going to disclaimer. I have no interest in opening a school. It's never been a driving force behind me, but I understand the why I have to be good at teaching. I need to be able to impart knowledge to other people so that we get that next generation of martial arts superstars. Mm -hmm. And, I know that the way I understand things isn't always the right way. It's not always the easiest way. It's generally speaking kind of random and out there. But I know that I need to be able to adapt to, you know, the six year old who can't quite understand why you need to punch hard Mm. or the adult who doesn't quite get why something needs to happen like this because they might have done it differently at one point. Yeah. And I really want to start getting better at that, being able to express myself in a way that everybody gets it. That's a great goal. Thank you. Because I really like that aha moment. I understand it now. I can do it. Yeah. There's a lot of joy to be taken from teaching something to someone and, and realizing that they've learned, you've helped them learn that without what you were showing them, they may not have gotten to wherever they are and... You know, I found that I learn just as much, if not more, teaching people as I do as a traditional student. Oh, yeah, I definitely learn more teaching people, like patience. Yeah, <laughs> patience <laughs> a lot of one, patience, especially with the kids, right? Yep. Do you have any parting advice? Any last words for people listening? Listen to yourself. Now, it's kind of vague and out there, but I'll explain a little bit more. Basically. You're your biggest detractor. You're really the only person who can stop you from doing whatever you want to do, where you think you need to go in the martial arts. So listen to yourself, but then just say, you know what? I'm wrong. I'm going to prove myself wrong because proving myself wrong, I'm going to prove everybody else to everybody else that I can be everything that I need to be. And also stretch every day. Okay. (laughs) That's the that's something that I kick myself in the butt about every day only because I can't kick myself in the head anymore. (laughs) You used to be able to kick yourself in the head. Yep. With intentionally, sometimes. (laughs) Okay. Cause I don't, I don't remember this This is before I met you. This was when I was like eight. I'd have a tendency to throw like a high front kick or an ax kick. And I'd kind of club myself in the forehead (laughs) with my shin. I don't know if that was just bad posture on my part, but (laughs) A combination of bad posture and maybe some incredible flexibility. Yeah, way back in the day. That's cool. Maybe maybe you can ask your mom. Maybe she has some pictures of that. That would be fun. I hope not. <laughs> well, I'm going to find out. Mm-hmm. And if they're there, I'm going to post them. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> no problem. All right. Well, cool. Thanks. I really appreciate you coming on and testing out the portable interview rig. Well, we had a couple bobbles, but figured it out. And If people are hearing this, it worked. Yep. (laughs) So um, if they're not hearing it, they won't know. Exactly. So we're kind of protected there. But um, really appreciate it. And thanks for being on Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. No problem. I had a great time. Thank you for listening to this episode of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. 
I had a lot of fun recording it, and I hope you enjoyed listening. A big thank you to Master Goodall for being a test subject and being so candid. Please be sure to subscribe to the show so you never miss one of our weekly episodes. If you like the show, we'd really appreciate a five-star review on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you download your podcasts. Believe it or not, these reviews help us grow quite a bit. You can check out the show notes with links to all of the books, movies, and more that we talked about, and those notes are over at whistlecakemartialartsradio.com. While you're there, if you want to be a guest on the show, or you know someone that would be a wonderful interview, please fill out the guest form. And of course, if you'd like to learn more about the great products we make at Whistlekick, please check us out on the web at whistlekick.com. Train hard, smile, and have a great day.